We're rolling? Okay. You didn't tell me what you want to talk about. Whatever you want me to talk about. Yeah, well, no, that's not how it works. When I was a younger lawyer, I felt like there was a formula or an outline that I had to follow. Whereas, as I've gotten into it a little bit more, that's gone out the window. So, you might even be a better lawyer in that moment because you're less nervous. 100%. And I get to take more risks. Right. You're, as you know, to grow and be better, you want to be able to take risks. And, and having that in place and that safety net in place allowed me to take more risks and really go after and be a great, you know, a better trial attorney and just kind of see what happens. Attorneys are taught to challenge everything, tear things apart, break them down. But the qualities that make lawyers great can be some of the worst for running a business. At every stage of growth, running a business and practicing law can feel overwhelming. And what happens when you try to add life and family to the mix? It can feel nearly impossible. You don't have to do this alone. I'm Maria Monroy, co-founder and president of LAWRIC, a leading SEO agency for ambitious law firms. Each week we hear from the industry leaders on what it really takes to run a law firm, from marketing to manifestation. Because success lies in the balance of life and law, we're here to help you tip the scales. Today I'm live with Sevi Fisher. I'm Sevi Fisher. I'm a partner at the Simon Law Group. I'm also the trial director and trial attorney at the Simon Law Group. The Simon Law Group sounds familiar. We discussed jury selection, balancing the work life balance, talked about high lows. Oh, yes. Which right. was great. Well, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, what's it like working with Bob Simon? I think everybody wants to know. I mean, it's a treat. Is it's, it? Yeah, it's a treat. Um, no, nah, I mean, who doesn't love Bob? Like, Bob's just got that, you know, yeah, that energy that, like, I feel like everybody's just kind of... He's very relatable, I think. He's yeah. very down to earth. Yeah, he's just got that personality. You ever just meet somebody in your life that, like, you know, you could listen to them talk forever and it just, like, feels like, you know, I don't know... You, there's certain things in life that you're like, oh my gosh, the time's dragging on. I'm like, what time is it? Oh my God, are we done yet? Like when you go to the gym, sometimes I look up, I'm like, gosh, is it like the end of the hour yet, right? Yeah. But when there's certain people you talk to, I feel like Gary Dordick has that too, where you can just kind of listen to them and like, you, you could just go on for an hour and you feel like, oh man, I need more time, you know, type of thing. So Bob shares that quality, I think. That's why I work for him. That's why I work with him. How long have you been working with him? I've worked with him since I've been uh, out of law school. So 2013, I started working for Bob... In July of 2013, as a like sort of a law clerk waiting for my bar results. Wow, really? And so yeah, I think I was the fourth or fifth attorney there. And how did you? Persons. How did you connect? So Brandon and I went to law school together, and oh, we were wow. actually in the same section for the first. Uh, they call it the one L year in law school for any non attorneys uh, watching. But um, so one L year, we had all the same classes together, and um, we would golf on Fridays together, and then. Eventually, um, I'm a really good golfer, you know, and Bob was trying to get his name out there a little bit. He was just getting the firm going and doing marketing and he sponsored a Clippers tournament with all the Clippers players at Trump national golf tournament. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was before Trump was president. So nobody hold that against him. So, but he texted Brandon and said, Hey, I need a, I need a really good golfer. Do you know someone? He goes, Hey, you gotta meet Sevy. So then I met Bob for the first time at this golf tournament. Bob's a terrible golfer, by the way, <laughs> but I met him there and, uh, the rest is kind of history. He, he basically was just like, I need, you know, I'm starting my firm. Like, I want to talk to you, you know, I want you to, to work for me. And he kind of just would make jokes about it. And then eventually, uh, came up and stayed at his house. Me and my wife went out with him and his wife and he offered me a job officially. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So I heard you're really good at jury selection. Can we talk about that for a second? We can talk about that for a second. I don't know if I'm good at it. I think I... I I've heard you're good at it. Well... I researched you before. Yeah? Yeah. I asked around. Okay. I mean, we don't know anyone. Who'd like, you talk to? You talk I to can't all, tell you. The, okay. But I heard you're really good at jury selection. Yeah. Well, I guess it just depends on the case. <laughs> so talk to us about that. What, what do you think makes you good at it? I mean... I, I think I just, uh, you know, I'm the type of guy I like to go out. I like to have a few beers and I like to talk to people. I like to meet new people. And I think, uh, I'm comfortable doing it. I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm comfortable making fun of myself. And I think that's all it takes to be a good lawyer, a good trial lawyer specifically. And, uh, more, I guess even more specific, uh, to pick a jury. For the record, Sevi's actually drinking 
right now. Mm-hmm. He's not being very supportive in my. Um, I don't know what what the right oh, word uh, is. Oh yeah, yeah. You you kind of take my it easy quest on the drinks. to minimize drinking. Literally, he's drinking right now. For those I'm of a, you that are not watching the video, I'm a very bad influence. You are. I've been Were told you? that as well. Yeah, I'm very upset about it. Uh, I've actually met Sevi's wife. She's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, you guys are super cute. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lucky man. I'm very lucky. I get yeah. told that a lot, and I I know I it. I mean, she so. is hot. So. Super hot. Yeah, yeah she is. I, I agree. Just my type. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's been, what, 10 years then that you've been at the Simon Law Group. Mm-hmm. What have been some of your challenges from then to now? Gosh, challenges. Um, you know, I think you know they change over time, but I would say, uh, you know, when you start as a lawyer at any new firm, you know, no matter what kind of personality you have or how much the folks that hired you like you, I think the biggest challenge, you know, at the beginning is just, you know, some validation. You want to show them that you're worthy of working for such a, such a great firm or, um, something like that. So, you know, that motivates you a lot. I think that's a big challenge, at least in the first part until you, you know, get some results or show people that you know what you're doing, um, at a time when you really don't know what you're doing, right? you know, especially, um, other than that over time, you know, as, as when I first started working there, I didn't have kids. Um, then I had kids and I, and then, so that challenge that comes with that, I think was just, um, I don't want to say balancing, but managing time, um, you know, just between the family and the trial aspect and work. Um, but you know, it's, our firm's super chill and very understanding. We're very family oriented. So I would say like even that challenge was way less challenging than I think most other firms would have yeah I'm starting to see like a pattern like everyone seems pretty chill that works at the Simon Law Group I I wonder if that's like a requirement yeah well I think it's just the environment you know Bob's chill Brad's pretty chill um you know the rest of us are chill all the partners are chill you know it's not like a typical like this crotchety old like person that's just like kind of scary and it's just never been the vibe at our firm ever yeah, it's, it's interesting because I have so many friends that are unhappy, and these are younger lawyers, right, so probably mid to late 30s, that are really unhappy at their current firms. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the Simon Law Group, from everything I've heard, and people could say, oh, it's BS, but like the fact that the partners have been there for so long, and mm-hmm. like right out of law school, right? So you, then you brought in Grayson, And now you're both partners. You guys have been there nine, ten years. Mm -hmm. And the way that you guys describe what it's like working there, I think can be very expanding for the lawyers that are at a firm and they're not happy and they think that every firm is like that. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not. Right. Well, I guess, you know, what I've seen in my 10 years is, you know, the Simon Lager, it's sort of the exception, not the rule, right? Oh, absolutely. You see all these other folks who are you know starting to get their their bearings and getting some good results in trial and then they're you know eventually they're out they're starting their own firm a lot of them are going to to jhq you know what have you You know what we see in marketing or in results or in the courtroom as these like great firms you're seeing people leave them all the time not the case with our firm nobody you know very few people leave our firm willingly um and, you know, to be honest with you, when I when I went to law school, when I was growing up, I always wanted my own thing. You know, I wanted my name on something. I wanted to be the owner, the, you know, buck stops with me type of type of person. And I had that even first starting job with the Simon Lager. But I was like, oh, eventually, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go off on my own and have my own thing. But, I, you know, I just, with how great we have it and how great everybody is to us, it's just, it's not even in my plans right now. And what do you think makes it such a great work environment? Letting people just, letting your employees do them, letting the attorneys be themselves, you know? Uh, I've never felt a lot of oversight in my capacity, as a, even as an associate, you know, um, unless I need it, unless I ask for help. You know, I did a number of trials, but the first trial I actually did with Bob, like, he's not sitting there telling me, like, oh, you 
fuck this up. You did this wrong. Like, do this, do that. He's like, no, like, this is you. Like, you're, you're doing you and you're doing a great job. So I think, you know, that really helps. And I love that aspect, actually. Um, sometimes it can be, you know, it's scary. You know, he's got a lot of trust in his attorneys. Um, and also, you know, it's something that he always tells me to actually do more of, you know, let go, quit being control freak, like let go, <laughs> let whoever's trying this case with you, you know, whether it's their first trial or second trial or third trial, because I want to take over everything, right? Cause I feel like it's on me no matter what, as the person who's got the most experience, I'm like, if I, if we lose, it's on me, if we win, it's on me. So I kind of, I don't want people to do certain witnesses or I want to, you know, do 99% of the trial. And he's like, dude there was a time where I let you do those things, right? You, you got to let go. So, you know, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. Like I like to control things, but there's only so much you can do. Right. And if you want your team to grow, you got to let them make the mistakes that they're going to make. hundred percent. And, and you don't want them to be afraid to make mistakes because if they're afraid to make mistakes, then they're going to be afraid to take chances. Right. And that's not good for growth, period. Right. And the better they do, ultimately, and the more experience they get, the less stress some of us are going to have later on because we've got other folks that we can trust now. We can trust them now because they have the experience of being put in those shitty, you know, uncomfortable situations. And so I, that's kind of how I look at it, um, you know, is, is it's going to put less stress on everybody. And, you know, everybody being better puts less stress on everybody. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Now there are nine partners, nine or ten. That's no, what I don't even know now. Uh, seven, eight. I think nine. Including How do you guys um, like? Who does what? That's a lot of partners. That is a lot of partners. Sometimes I don't know who does what, but let me think. <laughs> um, Brad and Jenny basically just like keep everybody under control, run the litigation. They do a lot of case screening, like the intake that comes in. Um, it's funny because they're like they're like the conservative like smart people in the firm kind of make sure everybody else doesn't you know take some wild flyer case that we shouldn't be taking you know because the trial lawyers it's funny because the trial lawyers have a different mentality than like the the lawyers that don't try cases the trial lawyers like you could ask like grace and bob myself you know evan jason now um you know we're a little bit more like quick with the trigger i would say like, we get a little summary of a case. We're like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, we could take that, you know? And they're like, whoa, 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 slow down, guys. Like, we haven't even, like, read the file, you know? So that's Brad and Jenny, uh, sh you know, a bunch of case screening. What do every you do? I try cases, first of all. Secondary to that, I do a lot of expert depositions. Mm -hmm. And any deposition that, you know, non any non-expert deposition that might be a little bit, I don't know, just challenging or fun, I do choose the trialers, make sure every trial we have, we have meetings every, I would say two to three weeks, I set meetings with all the uh, trial team, as well as um, the managers of our cases. And we make sure we go about three months out. So if we were having a meeting today, which it's March, we'd go over all the trials for March, April, and end of May. And I make sure there's bodies on all those cases. We briefly discuss the cases, make sure we have our experts lined up. Um, and you know make sure they're in a good spot and they're being worked up and if there's any you know questions or advice or strategy questions things like that that the managers want to ask or any other attorney trial attorney whatever um we use that as an opportunity to do that too are you guys all responsible also for bringing in cases when you use the word responsible it's almost sounds like it's mandatory but yes and no um you well, are you expected to, I guess, is my question. Well, I think if you've got a referral, you, you don't send it to another firm. But, <laughs> I'd hope not. But I don't think anybody's, you know, nobody's sitting there saying, like, look, you, Mr. Associate or Mr. Part, like, you're, Why haven't yeah, you? you're fired if you don't get X amount of referrals. That's just not the case. Like, the referrals can help you grow and make money individually. So it's better for you if you do it. So if you're not doing it, it's kind of, or at least trying to do it, it would be kind of silly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I heard that you did this thing because of this trial you had that was during COVID where you did a high and low negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us about that? So a high low agreement is simple. It's, it's coming into trial and, you know, maybe a case that you're not so sure on. It's, it's making sure you're putting 
your client first. And why do I say that? Well, there are certain things that happen if you lose out, if you outright lose a case at trial, the, or you don't beat the defendant's last statutory offer, which is also called a 998 in California. Um, if you don't beat that and you lose a trial, they can come after your client for costs. And it's not like they're coming after me, the attorney for costs, they're coming after the client. So in my efforts leading up to trial, I always, and it depends on the defense attorney, but nine times out of 10, I always ask them, Hey, you ever thought about, you know, should we talk about a high low? You know, and they all, How common is this? it's very, from what I've learned in, in talking about a lot of, to a lot of defense attorneys and, and bringing up this subject matter with them, it's, uh, kind of uncommon, I would say, but I saw Bob do it one time and ever since then, I just loved him. It, it gives you, it gives you a form of, we'll get back to the control. It gives you a form of control <laughs> in an otherwise, you know, uncontrollable environment. And so like, for example, um, I had a high low agreement. I've had a high low agreement where, you know, maybe the policy is $1.25 million on a specific case. I'm just using this as a hypothetical. My client maybe has a hip injury, right? She's got a hip labrum repair. She wants, she wants to settle for the case for $350,000, but the defense won't offer more than 175. In that case, um, you know, you might talk about a high low, Hey, you know, why don't we do a high low, a trial? I'll cap it at your policy, $1.25 million. That's the highest I can get. Even if I hit this out of the park and hit it for three, four, five million million, I am capped at $1.25 million. But if I lose and you defense me completely and I get zero, you're giving me $125,000, right? So I've got those barriers and we're going to waive all post-trial motions. We're going to waive appeal and each side's going to cover their own costs. So that gives them incentive because they're going to look like a hero if I go spank them for over that amount at trial. Right. Um, and it also helps my client because if I get zeroed out, they just went from owing the defendant money in most case, these clients can't afford that. They have to file bankruptcy. If that happens, if they truly come after them, um, to maybe having 50 K in their pocket, like for losing, like it's, it seems like a no brainer, right? Um, you do need to be careful on those though, because, if you have a high low and the high is $1.25 million that you can get under any circumstances, don't go asking for $7 million at trial, right? Cause if the jury gives it to you, you're going to have a pissed off client. Why don't I get the seven? Mm -hmm. Why don't I get the $7 million? Um, but you know, there's so many different factors to take into account with those. Some of it is like, what, what do you think the chances are of appealable issues? We had this one case that just had, was strong with appealable issues. It was like a labor code case. Um, we had a really good high low on that. We were just nervous that no matter the outcome, it was getting taken up on appeal and stretch it out over another two to four years. Um, you know, how good your client is injuries, whether liability is an issue. Liability is a big, uh, you know, if liability is ever a, a huge dispute, I like to talk about high lows. Um, you can do so many different things with them too. You can get super creative. I think that's, I've never heard about that. I think that's why I love them so much is like, I feel like I can, they allow me to get my creative juices flowing. Like I had the last high low I did, we bifurcated liability from damages. This is the one that I was told about. Okay. Yes. And, and I was just, I came, we came up with this agreement and I was like, what if we just do this? Like we separate the damages. Damages was the most expensive portion. I had like six damages experts. So did the defense number of treating doctors. The damages portion of trial was going to cost us like $125,000 just to put on our evidence. And the liability was one guy, one expert. So I was like, well, why don't we just come up with an agreement that like, we'll keep damages for another day or just take them off the table, but we'll do a, a high low agreement. We'll just try the case on liability. It'll be a four day trial. Um, and based on what percentage, right? You know, if the jury finds the defendant zero to 24% at fault, you pay me 75,000. If the jury finds the defendant 25 to 49% at fault, you pay me 400,000. The jury finds the defendant, you know, and so on and so forth up to the limits of their policy. And so I thought that was cool. That is I, really was, cool. Yeah, I was just super creative. I've never done anything like it, but it worked, and it worked in my favor. Um, you know, it was a very quick trial, good result, happy client. Literally, this client is like, like she texted me after we sent her her check, and she told me that I gave her a second shot at life because she was like five grand in credit card debt and like you know almost had to 
you know, file bankruptcy. One of the best clients of all time, and I love her. How did you have that idea? Like, what made you separate? Like, just you know, I I just feel like I get those ideas in in cases that I'm not a hundred percent confident in, where I look at the evidence and I'm a little bit. I wouldn't say not confident in, but I feel like there's a lot more risk. It probably makes you more confident going into trial. Right. So you might even be a better lawyer in that moment because you're less nervous. 100%. And I get to take more risks. Right. Right. Which we were talking about that earlier. You want yes. your, as you know, to grow and be better. You want to be able to take risks and, and having that in place and that safety net in place allowed me to take more risks and really go after and be a great, you know, a better trial attorney and just kind of see what happens. So yeah, I love them. I love them a lot. Unless it's just like a great case, you know it, you know, you're going to go kick the shit out of the other side. I'll never do a high low in that case. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, Cause they're never going to agree to my terms. Yeah. It's gotta be a case where both sides kind of like, well, this could go either way. 50, right. 50, 50. Yeah. You're creating a win win basically yeah. where everyone feels good about it, but not maybe not necessarily great. Cause it wasn't, you well, didn't know to begin with anyways. And in every high low I've done, right? Like we want to make everybody look good. Whether it's, and it's not just us and the, and the clients, but the defense attorney, they got a job to do too, right? They've got a client, they're trying hard and that, you know, we make each other's worlds go around and every high low I've ever done, whether I've just done a really good job, got a great result or not, every single one, the defense lawyer's client has been super happy and that's important for many reasons. It's kind of, everybody got to get out of there and look good. Well, now I'm curious, why is it important? Them looking good to their client gets them more business their cl and gets them more trust from their client. Their client, when I say their client, I'm talking about insurance companies. Right, right, but why does that help you? Why does it help me? Yes. Well, the more they like me and more approachable and trustworthy I am to the, the defense lawyer. Right. Got and it. the next time I'm going to get it, they're going to say, this guy's a reasonable dude. We're going to come up you know, with stipulations, agreements if we can. I know Sevy's approachable. And I like that. That's one of the things I think I'm really good at is creating those relationships. And they make my life 10 times better and, and easier and make the defense lives 10 times easier because nobody, I mean, nine times out of 10, I have a relationship like that with the defense lawyer. There's the one defense lawyer out there. It's always going to be an asshole. They're right. always, you know, so... The, you can't really negotiate with them. Those you are approachable, though. Yeah. I mean, I've only hung out with you a few times, and I feel like I know you. Yeah. Like, well, I think you're very approachable. Well, thanks. And maybe that's why people say you're good at jury selection. Yeah. Well, do you think you connect with a jury? It's funny. I think I do. It's funny because I don't feel like I'm, I do anything great. Like, everyone's always like, do you have an outline for jury selection? I'm like, no, not really. Like, I just go talk to some folks. Do you use your intuition? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But mainly, I just vibe with them, you know? I like, you vibe with I like to vibe with jurors. I like, uh, look, you just got to put yourself in their shoes. They're in a fucked up situation. They got, they got required to be here under the law, but for lawyers, it's cool. But for these folks who maybe like can't afford to take a day off or whatever, they're, they're hating their life. And they just got told that they're here because of a car accident. They are immediately before I even talk, they hate us. So my job is, my goal when I stand up is I want them to like me immediately. And you're I likable, I want, though. But yeah. you, you, that must come easy to you'd you. You'd be surprised. You know, the first couple times I did jury selection, I think I was a little stiff and lawyer-like and used stupid words. When I was a younger lawyer, I felt like there was a formula or an outline that I had to follow. Whereas as I've gotten into it a little bit more, that's gone out the window. You know, I've got a couple questions that if I get the, based on how a juror's answer, like I know how they're going to go for me in that case. The other 90% of jury selection is just me getting to know them and, you know, making sure they know that just because I'm a lawyer in a suit today, like I just want them to know I'm normal. Uh, Cause I am, you know, like if I'm not in a suit, like, you know, I wear, this is the most dressed up I get without a suit on, you know, other than that, it's like sweats. This and, is you dressed up? Yeah. This is my, this is like, everyone's always like, you know, did you just come off the golf course? I'm like, no, that's just my, that's just my casual gear, you know? So, so side note for those of you not watching the video, I had to change. I had to dress down for this episode because Sevi showed up. Well, I appreciate so you doing casual. that. And you probably appreciate me doing it too. Cause you're, do. you're probably more comfortable. I am way more comfortable. <laughs> I am way more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's really exciting in your life right now? Exciting in my life. Um, my son lost his second tooth last night. Oh. 
How many kids do you guys have? Three? I've got three, yeah. Yeah, so uh, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a six-year-old. How do you balance... I know you didn't want to use that word earlier, but how do you balance work and life? And I, it, again, I think working at, I swear to you guys, like this is not a promo for the Simon <laughs> Law Group, but I know that for Bob, that's important. So it probably, like it's part of the culture at the firm. I would assume that it's okay for everyone to have a work-life balance. Yeah. I mean, I would just say, you know, at, uh, Especially lately, I feel like, you know, before having kids, I felt like I would go to every seminar. Everything I could get my hands on, I would go to. I haven't seen you at one in like a year. Precisely. I have to go to the ones and pick and choose the ones that, that you know, whereas before maybe I'd go to 12 to 15 a year. Wow. Now I go to like six max. And I try to go to some of uh, the family-oriented ones. I love the Aboda one in Hawaii because I can take my kids. Aboda. Aboda. That's a California one, right? It's uh, it's a national one, but it yes, is? it's a boat of California. Yeah, you know what a boat is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I didn't. I've never been. So. Yeah, so I like that one. I like the Palm Springs one. It's at a family-friendly resort, Omni, uh, in Palm Springs. And um, who's and I still is that? like Omni, even though I sued them. <laughs> but uh, that, wait, what that conference C- is that? C A C A O I E. It's like a C A O C and oh, I E crossover. But you do O C T L I too. <laughs> you do mainly state. In state, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I try not to go out of state. Once in a while, there's like a ski one in like, you know, Western Trial Lawyers Association does one in my home state in Idaho. Um, so if I can kill two birds and see some family with that at the same time, I might try to do that. But yeah, very rarely. So when you go to conferences, you bring the family? I would say f- 80% of the time. You know, it doubles too, right? So I was talking about the abode of Hawaii. Our family trip every year is going to Hawaii. And... What we do is we do a week of the conference, which the conference is only like a three-hour session of, of talks. The rest of it is just meetups, happy hours. So we do an hour or a week of the conference, and then we do a week on the either the front end or the back end for the family. So I turn them into my family vacations just to make it easy with time management and trip preparations and all that. Try to make as many of those into just like family vacations as I, as I can. If I did that, we would be on vacation the whole year. What about day-to-day? Day-to-day is... is you know, it's funny because I, it's not a nine to five job. It's not, it's weird. Right. So there's days where like, you know, there's a, there's days where I have zero appearances. I'm an appearance guy, right? Like I, if there's not a deposition to be had or a trial to prepare for or be at, or, uh, somebody who needs my help preparing for a deposition or advice on how to prepare for trial, if there's none of that real serious stuff going on, I can go to, you know, family stuff. I take my son to to, he does parkour class every Thursday. No way. There's yeah. such a thing? Yes, he loves that it. That is so LA. And we've got a thing. We go to good stuff. It's this, you know, C minus restaurant <laughs> that's like just in the vicinity because there's no other restaurants, but like I don't even like it. But I go because he wants, it's our thing, you know, like we go there, it's just mine and his time and like he'll eat f- like Mickey Mouse pancakes and bacon every Thursday and I'll have like two IPAs and then we'll go home. I try to be present. I only golf during the weekdays. I'm a big golfer. And no, you don't say. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You hadn't mentioned it. You didn't know. <laughs> uh, I'm also really, really good. But I go during the weekdays. I don't go on the weekends uh, because the weekends are dedicated to my family if I'm not in trial. Straight up. You just got to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't, get the hell out. Go do your own thing. You know? Like, if, if you don't like where you're at or where you're working and you're not happy, you know, do something about it. Thank you so much to Sebi Fisher for everything he shared with us today. If you found the story valuable, please share it with someone you want to see succeed. Subscribe so you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review. It goes a long way to help others discover the show. Catch us next week on Tip the Skills with me, Maria Monroy, president of Law Rank. Hear how the best in the business broke out of limiting beliefs, overcame adversity, and built a thriving, purpose-driven business in the process. If you found this story valuable, uh, see, I don't, I don't even remember what I'm supposed to say. Follow him on TikTok. Please share it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a TikTok. I'm just kidding. <laughs>